take a friendly regular convex polygon. You'll want to give it some colors. Cut it along one of its diagonals. Repeat with the pieces until eventually all there is is triangles. Triangles don't have diagonals, so stop there. You're left with a sort of jigsaw puzzle with triangular pieces. Since we are free to choose any diagonal at each step, there are many possible puzzles. For instance, these two have different shapes. And these, while having similar shapes, differ by rotation. You can then ask yourself how many ways there are to cut that polygon into triangles. Now an octagon is a bit too complicated. Let's start with something simple. A triangle is already cut into triangles. There's only one way of doing nothing to it. A square, as you know, has two diagonals. Cutting along either leaves two triangles. That's two ways of cutting a square. For a pentagon, notice that all diagonals look the same. A trapezium on one side and a triangle on the other. Once you cut a diagonal, and either diagonal of the trapezium, you've cut a V-shape into a pentagon. There are five ways to do that, and so five ways to cut a pentagon into triangles. For a hexagon, it's more complicated. There are two kinds of diagonals. If you cut one of the long diagonals, there are four ways to cut the rest. An arrow, an S, an N, and an arrow pointing the other way. There are three long diagonals, so we get three rotations of those. If you don't cut a long diagonal, you cut out either of these middle triangles. Overall, that makes for 14 ways of cutting a hexagon into triangles. What about a heptagon? Well, pause the video and try it out yourself. If you did do it, you should have found out that the answer is 42, and that counting these things gets a little finicky. You may wonder whether there's a more systematic way of getting these numbers, and you wouldn't be the first. In the mid-18th century, a guy called Signer came up with the following idea. Look at the edge going clockwise from the red corner. In the end, it would be an edge of a triangle, and the third corner of that triangle may be any of the other corners of our polygon. Let's say it's the blue corner. Then we have a pentagon on one side and a four-sided polygon on the other. We shall both get cut into triangles. Now they're not regular polygons, but they have all their diagonals inside of them, so it's really the same. For each way of cutting a four-sided polygon and each way of cutting a pentagon, we get a way of cutting the octagon, where the red, orange, blue triangle is one of the pieces. That's two times five ways. Depending on the choice of the third corner of the triangle with the red, orange edge, we may be left with nothing on one side and a heptagon on the other, a triangle and a hexagon, a four-sided polygon and a pentagon, as we just saw, a pentagon and a four-sided polygon, a hexagon and a triangle, or a heptagon and nothing. Greek and Latin are nice, but numbers can make the pattern more obvious. The natural way to continue that pattern is to say that the nothingness that was left with the heptagon is a two-sided polygon. It's a bit odd, but it's awfully convenient. Now we can use the numbers of ways to cut those smaller polygons to get the number of ways to cut the octagon. 132. It's a good thing we didn't have to actually cut all of that. We can go on that way. If we cut a triangle out of an n-sided polygon, we'll be left with two polygons, similarly. At this point, it helps to give things a name. We call those numbers C0, C1, C2, and so on, so that the number of ways to cut an n-sided polygon into triangles is cn minus 2. cn minus 2 can then be computed as c0 times cn minus 3, plus c1 times cn minus 4, plus c2 times cn minus 5, and so on. If you like fancy annotation, that's the sum for i ranging from 0 to n minus 3 of the ci cn minus 3 minus i. These numbers, 1, 1, 2, 5, 14, 42, and so on, which we can define by just the first value and the recurrence, are known as the Catalan numbers, after a guy who in the 19th century wrote a paper about something else which contained a remark about them. It's a bit strange, to be honest. Now you could solve the recurrence and express a Catalan number in terms of factorials or binomial coefficients, but instead, here's a doodle game. Draw alternating red and black points on a circle. 
match red points to black points by straight lines in such a way that the lines do not cross. Keep going, until no point is left alone. How many ways are there to do that? Let k be the number of points of either color, and number the black points clockwise from 0 to k-1. This red point may be matched to any of the black points, let's say point number i. Then on one side of this line we have i points of either color, and on the other side we have k minus i minus 1 points of either color. We cannot have lines going from one side to the other, since they would cross the line that's already drawn. So you really have two smaller independent problems. The number of ways to match both sides is the product of the numbers of ways to match either side, and the number of ways to match the whole thing is the sum over the choices of i. So we'll get the catalog numbers again. There are ck ways to match those points. Let's open a parenthesis. Parentheses obey two rules. You must close them, and you cannot close them before you open them. For instance, this is not correct. We have a parenthesis that doesn't close. And here, we have a parenthesis that was never opened. How many ways are there to correctly write k pairs of parentheses? Well, there's a bit of a recurring theme to this video, of course. But why is that? The first parenthesis is an opening parenthesis by the second rule, and it has a matching closing parenthesis by the first rule. Now let's say inside of those you have i pairs of parentheses, the rest of them follows, Again, you have split your problem into two parts, and you get signals recurrence. We can now close this parenthesis. We had 2k individual parentheses here. In that game with points and line, we had 2k points. You can wonder whether there's a correspondence between those, and what happens if your points are not colored, or if they are not on a circle, or neither. Those are very interesting questions, and in fact they are the subject of active research. But this is outside the scope of this video. Instead, I'd like to list some more things that are counted by catalog numbers. The catalog number CK is the number of full binary trees with k plus 1 leaves. It is the number of ways to parenthesize a product of k plus 1 factors. It is the number of Kekule structures on a triangular benzenoid. It is the number of shortest paths for a rook across the long edge of the k plus 1 by k plus 1 triangular chessboard. It is the number of pseudonot free RNA secondary structures with k paired nucleotides ignoring unpaired nucleotides. The list goes on. Here are three questions for you to think about. They are hints in the description, but try it out yourself. You might find a more elegant solution. First, why are all these things counted by catalog numbers? You could get signals recurrence for each of them, but it can be more enlightening to try to find correspondences. How do you turn a polygon cut into triangles into a tree? How do you turn a tree into a parenthesizing of a product? How do you turn that into parentheses? That's not quite as easy as it sounds. Into a path on a search bomb? Second, that example about RNA was a bit contrived. Why should we ignore those poor unpaired nucleotides? How can you compute the number of pseudonot free RNA secondary structures on K nucleotides? The rules here are that all pairs should be on the same side of the strand, and that while you may have unpaired nucleotides anywhere, you must have at least one in each hairpin loop. Finally, those polygons that we cut into triangles were very colorful. What if you want them painted black? Then both ways of cutting a square will look the same, all ways of cutting a pentagon will look the same, and you'll only get three different ways of cutting a hexagon. How do you compute those numbers? And why do they count hexaflexagons? You'll find hints for the exercises, as well as historical remarks, acknowledgements, and references in the video description. I thank you very much for your attention, and if you have any questions or remarks, feel free to comment.